Of Google, for Google for nonprofits, Google grants, uh, Google for nonprofits, and YouTube for nonprofits. Uh, if you have a 501c3, uh, that's really the only eligibility requirement for this. Uh, you can review the eligibility requirements, but mainly if you're a 501c3, you qualify. You apply to the program. Uh, once you get it, go to the next tab, Brandon. Once you get it, Once you, you get, get, it, uh, you get uh, Google Apps for Nonprofits, which I'm going to go through in more detail. You get Google Ad Grants, which gives you up to $10,000 a month of free uh, ad, ads on Google that you can place. We've had several months where we've used that full amount, $10,000 worth of traffic hitting our website every month. Uh, for free. Uh, for free. The YouTube, the YouTube nonprofit program, which Brandon's going to go more into and is really what you guys are here to learn about, which includes free services like live streaming and the Google Earth Outreach. So I'm going to start by really just going into the Google Apps for Nonprofits. And I should mention. Um, we have been using Google Apps here for about seven or eight years since they implemented this program. It, it's really like transformed the efficiency of the organization. We don't teach this because we're sponsored by Google. It just weirdly happens that we got two Vistas that, that were uh, supported by Vista starting this year. But we've been teaching and promoting Google Apps for nonprofits forever. We're not doing it because, uh, because of any alliance or allegiance with Google. But it is an amazing uh, free service that Google offers. So uh, we're just going to go down through, through some of them. The most obvious is, is Gmail. Um, if you send an email to me, I'm, my email is Tony at OpenMediaFoundation.org. You don't need. You can still have that custom URL or custom email, but all of our email here at the organization is hosted through Google. Uh, it's it it's an amazing service. We used to host our own email server here, and it's just so much easier and better that since we've switched to Gmail. Uh, calendars. It's amazing. You know, we can all see each other's calendars, we can schedule each other's calendars, you can set up whatever kind of preferences and restrictions you want on, on approving it, people adding things to your calendars and who can and can't see your calendar. Uh, but calendaring has become so much easier as an organization since we switched to using Google Calendars. Google Drive um, now kind of incorporates Google Docs, Google Spreadsheets, and Google Slides, but it's also just like, um, like Dropbox. It's just a huge online storage service. Uh, that's also free with uh, Google for nonprofits and Google Apps. So if you want to um, store videos online or you just want to exchange some large files like you would with a service like Dropbox, Google Drive can store any kind of file, not just Google Docs, but it can, it can store videos, music, whatever. I think it's important to note too that it's a full-fledged word, full word processor. So very yeah. powerful. So yeah, we so get, we uh, used to get uh, the free Microsoft or cheap Microsoft s software through uh, TechSoup, if any of you guys use TechSoup. We've, even though it's cheap and in some cases for us even free, we don't even get it anymore. We don't use it because everyone just uses Google Docs for, for Word and, and Google Spreadsheets instead of Excel. Um, and it's, it's a, in our opinion, in terms of collaboration and accessibility, uh, just a way superior product. So uh, I won't go into docs and um, spreadsheets and slides, which is like PowerPoint. Um, but, uh, but let's do talk a little about Hangouts too. Really quick. So like Brandon's sitting over there. Uh, do you want me to initiate? Why don't you initiate? Thanks. Why don't you video chat me? Uh, so you can, you, can you can just chat with each other, chat with your staff. You can do things like this, us talk back and forth like, like Skype. Um, you can also do, let's stop this so the audio goes away. <laughs> um, but you can also do what's called Hangouts on Air, which is we could call in a few other people, include like Robbie. Whoever talks, it automatically switches to show them because whoever's, whoever has the noise coming, it, it automatically switches to show them on the big screen. Uh, you can stream those live on, on YouTube as well so that l literally millions of people could be watching your, um, your conversation. You can have up to 10 live participants for free in a Google Hangout. Uh, you can have, that's people participating, actually speaking, but people watching, if you do Google Hangouts on air, you can have truly unlimited people 
uh, watching that. So it's something like if you've ever used WebEx or other services like that that they charge a lot of money for, this is a totally free service with this uh, with Google for nonprofits that, in our opinion, is totally superior to like WebEx or many of the other options. Um, my question is in regards to what kind of internet speed you would need for that. Specifically, in my situation, I have a lot of people that are on reservations and tribes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I've never even really considered it because I've I've never because usually it's an alternative either either Hangouts or you're using WebEx or using something else, and I would assume they all use about the same amount of of bandwidth. You know, if you can use Skype, then you can use Hangouts, but uh, but I don't actually know the the bandwidth like requirements. But I'm sure that if you just check on Google Hangouts on the site, it'll probably go through what they'd suggest as a minimum minimum bandwidth. We haven't ever run into a bandwidth issue here, and we actually don't have the most robust internet connection here at the Open Media Foundation. But also works well on uh, a 3G network, mm -hmm. uh, even a slow network. On my phone, it works oh, decently well. That's actually what ends up happening a lot. A lot of our residents will do it on their phones, phones mm -hmm. versus whatever internet access Yeah. So anyone that has an Android phone has it automatically built into their Android phone. So um, we could have just done that exact same thing, but me with my phone huh. over the 4G network or over the wireless network. Yeah? So I'm going to ask some probably stupid questions. Mm -hmm. Us old people kind of don't get the hang of this tech stuff. But uh -huh. if this, we're talking about Hangout. Uh, one of the issues that I've run into as of late is that we lost our conference calling service, and as a nonprofit, can't afford to pay an arm and a leg to set up a conference service. Mm -hmm. So would this be one way that we could uh, conduct a board meeting if, if I gave all of our board members access to Hangout? Mm -hmm. You have a maximum of 10 people that can be participating on the video. Uh, I think okay. you can add another 10 people that are voice only. Okay. So if I wanted to call Brian, I could or Brandon over there, I could choose between the phone or the video. Okay. So if it's voice only, then yeah, you can you can do this, and then you can dial any cell phone, or you can dial, um, or you can dial uh, one of your contacts. Okay, cool. So yeah, up to ten people on video, and I think up to twenty if ten of them are by phone only. Okay, thank you. Sure. Hang on, that's free as part of the. So, are we ready? Yeah. Uh, so we're waiting for a five hundred one c three letter mm -hmm. from. Mm -hmm. um, but we have a tax ID number, so like as far as accessing these tools, what what's the gate? <laughs> my, he unlocks the gate. <laughs> my guess would be you have to have the 501c3 in place, and you have to be able to yeah be able to. Do I need to do that today for this board? No. Oh no. Yeah. Oh, okay. No. Yeah. No. It, for people that haven't already gone through, show that first tab again. It's just if you just Google Google for nonprofits, the website is just Google.com/nonprofits. Uh, that'll talk you through the eligibility requirements, the application process, and, and all of that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sure. Great. And some of the people in this class aren't even necessarily here with nonprofits, so you can still learn all of this stuff. But there's a couple things you won't have access to unless you are a nonprofit. There's a couple other ways around it. Or you pay for Google Apps, or with the Google, with the YouTube stuff, Brandon will show you. If you have at least 1,000 followers or subscribers to your channel, you get a lot of the same free stuff that you get automatically as a nonprofit here. Awesome. Yeah. So, uh, is there anything left on my no, I think that covers it. on my list? There's a whole bunch of other enterprise apps that are useful for you guys to look at that you also get free access to. We don't want to go through all of them here, but uh, one of them is like Google Voice, which might be also useful for people who don't want to set up a new conference call or, or even a phone system at their company. Um, but the last is this, uh, oh, Google Analytics, I should mention, yeah, so uh, you can Google, use get Google Analytics to um, evaluate who's on your website, what keywords, who are the main people linking in, uh, all the traffic to your site. We've used this to, um, we do a lot of work with the state legislature and uh, the, state leg uh, the site we built for the Colorado State Legislature. We've been tracking through Google Analytics for the past few years and uh, really blew up when we shifted to a new platform for them last year. And Analytics is our main tool for following it. 
AdWords I already mentioned, but that lets you set up these AdWord campaigns where you can say if you're looking for Native American resources in Denver, you can have a paid ad so that it's not just showing up in searches, but showing up up top with the sponsored links and on the, on the sidebar, if people have sponsored links on the sidebar, uh, and you get up to $10,000 a month of free AdWords clicks. So it's a pretty useful, useful thing. Uh, so lastly is YouTube for nonprofits. You want to just jump in? Sure, absolutely. Great. Um, as Tony enough subscribers, enough this subscribers, is YouTube Live is, is YouTube available. Live. That's one of the benefits. That's really the primary benefit of YouTube for nonprofits. Um, uh, it's entirely, it's, it's its own streaming service. So just like Livestream would be or Ustream or any of those, uh, YouTube Live works almost the exact same way. So, uh, and that's, I believe that's the biggest difference for, um, for YouTube for nonprofits. Am I overlooking anything? No, but on this whole list, too, we should mention that from, from YouTube to nonprofits to Gmail to Google Drive, the main benefits of these apps that we've experienced at Denver Open Media and Open Media Foundation is that it is, for us, a better way of organizing information. We keep everything on an admin server here that people, some of our staff could figure out how to access from home, others couldn't. And it was, it was just harder to find everything. Everything's a lot more organized. Everything's a lot more accessible. But the big thing is the collaboration. Um, I'm sure you guys have all seen Google Docs and Google Spreadsheets going, but we've had meetings or grant development meetings where we'll have eight or 10 people working on one document at one time. We can all be typing simultaneously, see what everybody else is doing, easily track all the changes that everyone did. You don't have multiple versions of documents floating around. So the whole idea of just collaborating on documents makes it so much so much easier. I forgot to mention that that's kind of the the impetus behind using all of this. Yeah, go ahead. You had mentioned some of the enterprise mm -hmm. apps too. Will mm -hmm. we get a list of those? Is there a presentation that we can follow up with that may list some of those? Brandon, I don't know where you can no, see uh, <laughs> It's not really important right now, but if there's a way we can access a list of those ones that maybe you use later, that would be Enterprise apps or something like yeah, that. Yeah, probably. I think a lot of these we're going to be like teaching classes on over over time, and it might be a little bit of a of a rabbit hole for us to talk about like Google Translate or Google Voice or right. or even like Blogger or uh, Google Sites. But we'll, we'll, we will be teaching classes on some of those the ones that we think are most useful. And yeah, if you just if you just do like a even just a Google search on on enterprise apps. Um, it'll go through like here's a here's a site that just kind of has all of the enterprise apps. Okay. Um, yeah. Great. Thank you. Sure. But here we're here to learn about. <laughs> here we are. <laughs> Let's talk about streaming. So how this is going to kind of work? We're going to start on YouTube and creating an event. Um, once we have our event set up, we're going to move to Wirecast which is an encoder, and that basically takes the signal and it pushes it out to YouTube for streaming. So we're going to start with YouTube. Um, we're gonna, I'm going to kind of do a few steps and then uh, pause and then let everybody catch up. So there's no need to be doing it while you can just kind of watch up here while we're, while we're walking through it. Um, I think that's about enough of a roadmap. I just kind of want everyone to understand. So live stream is, is essentially a video hosting site, right? They, the, the same way that you upload videos and then it stores them, you are also able to send stream, a stream directly and have it broadcast at the same time, roughly the same time. There's about a 45 second delay. But um, so that kind of makes sense to everybody. So what we're going to do is we need to, we need to set that event up at YouTube, and uh, all of these computers should be signed in, except for my own, I think. My name's not Ann. I don't want you to be tricked. Uh -huh. Boom. So uh, up here on the right, if you drop that little arrow down, you get your other options. And if you go to Video Manager, and again, it's up to you if you want to do this kind of as we're doing it, but we are going to allow time for everybody to step back and, and do it. Um, over here on the left, then you'll see live events, and you can go ahead and click on live events. Um, 
I, I think this is covered a little bit later, but I see that this big orange banner right here that says you have had one content ID match on your live stream. <laughs> I want to talk about that a little bit. So as you are preparing your stream, um, Google, YouTube has developed this really remarkable uh, algorithm for detecting copyrighted content. It is incredible. I mean, it's, I had uh, at an event, I had John Coltrane playing sort of idly in the background, not even really, I mean, not even very loudly at all. Um, and it killed the stream within about five minutes. Yeah. So, uh, and you will, you will lose your live streaming uh, privileges after a certain amount of infringements. So it's absolutely imperative that you are not broadcasting whatever, Christina Aguilera or whatever, you know, any kind of copyrighted music. Um, YouTube actually has, uh, you can Google it, but it's, uh, they have an audio library and you can pull audio from that for any of your videos. So you can just Google YouTube audio library and, uh, and find a, a library of, of content that they have approved for streaming and video use. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. um, and so we have a live band audition in March that is sort of like the, it's one of the kickoff events to the fair. So we have been wanting to live stream the auditions. Some of the bands are cover bands, so they would be playing other people's music. So how does that work then, or would that work? Uh, that's a really, really good question. Um, I've noticed the only, the most similar experience to that that I've had is uh, with classical music, uh, various orchestrations. I, I, I think they get confused. So if it's one symphony playing it that actually has released it and doesn't hold any rights to it, um, another symphony that holds the rights to it, it gets confused and it recognizes that. But I mean, that is, you know, really composed music. My guess is it wouldn't be similar enough to pick up. Um, I don't know what the actual rules are about broadcasting covers on YouTube. I we pay BMI and ASCAP fees every year for the festival to oh. cover ourselves, but I mean, with the auditions, it's a little bit different. So. Right. Um, I mean, my, my guess is you would be fine. Uh, you can, if it will get there, but there's a live manager where you can, it'll, it'll ping you for just a couple minutes before it kills your stream. It'll let you know. Um, so you might just kind of want to watch that. Uh, let it maybe let it happen once and then can reevaluate what you're going to do. Uh, again, though, I mean, the, the, I don't know how sensitive that algorithm is. I mean, it's it's. I think I, it's probably similar technology to like Shazam or Soundhound or whatever, where you can hold your phone up to a speaker and it'll it'll pick it up and it'll it'll find you know it'll tell you what song that is. I imagine it's similar technology, but often I can't sing that song and have it recognized. So I imagine it's it's similar. I think you'd probably be fine. Would be my guess. Um, good. So here we are in uh, YouTube. We have content ID covered. Don't broadcast any Britney Spears while you're doing your nonprofit events. Um, over here, in, uh, we're in live events. We, up on the upper right, we can create a new live event. And uh, we can give it a title. I'm just going to call mine Brandon. It's live stream. Um, you can set the time that you want it to start. Uh, it will let you start it earlier, but it's a little bit kind of fussy about it. I try and get it as close to the time that uh, I'm going to start as possible. So why don't we just say 4.30. Uh, it doesn't like you to put it in the past most often, uh, but like I said, again, you can start it earlier. Uh, a description, you know, any kind of description that describes your event is appropriate. Same with tags separated by commas that make everything a little bit more searchable. Um, so, for instance, theater or veterans or, you know, that kind of thing you might want to put as your tags in there. I'm going to go ahead and skip that. Um, this, this little tab right here, public, unlisted, private, for the purposes of this class, I'm going to ask that you uh, mark them as unlisted because we're going to go, when we create a stream, we're going to go ahead and create a stream. And uh, if you make it unlisted, then no one will be seeing your face broadcast on the internet as we set up our stream. So as we're setting it up here today, why don't we go ahead and set it up as unlisted. But typically, you'd probably want to leave it public so that people can find it on your channel. Uh, unlisted basically means that it's not going to show up. It's not searchable. You can't see it on your channel unless you are logged into your channel. Um, private means that you can only see it if you have a password. You can actually set a password. Um, rather than unlisted, you can just shoot somebody the link. So again, let's go ahead and set it as unlisted. 
category. Uh, you can have that nonprofits activism category. Uh, uh, I think that's unique to YouTube for nonprofits, um, but or whichever category fits you best. Right here, where it says type. Um, you can see that we can go ahead and broadcast to Hangouts on Air. Uh, I, we're not really going to get into any of that. So uh, go ahead and choose custom is what we'll choose. And again, I'm going to go back and we're going we're to go back and do all this together again if you're not following along. Uh, this advanced settings tab, it allows you to kind of do a whole lot. Um, for instance, the legislator, uh, as Tony was mentioning, we do live streaming of the legislator every day and we actually do use uh, YouTube Live, but we don't allow comments because obviously that's that's not what we're there for. We're there to broadcast. We're not there to collect public opinion. Um, we don't want people to be able to vote on those comments, and we don't want people to even see the ratings of the video. Standard YouTube license is almost always what I use. Um, you can check out the other rights and see uh, Creative Commons, uh, which again is uh, very very much what our organization believes in. But standard YouTube license is sufficient. Uh, syndication, uh, I don't know that that's really actually an option. Uh, I think it used to be. I think they're probably phasing that out. Caption certification, uh, you can, if, you, if you're working with captions, all of that's probably going to make sense. I'm not really going to go into that too much. Uh, allowing embedding means that you can take the embed code from this video, so you can really easily right click on it, copy embed code, and you can paste that into a website. So one of our uh, clients that we stream for often is Colorado Trust. What we do is we send them a few weeks ahead of time, we'll send them the embed code, and uh, they plug it into their website. And they organize viewing parties across the state that uh, they get together in one room with a big screen and, and watch these viewing parties as well as they have their live audience in there. Um, so it's, it's cool to be able to embed it because then you can, you can drive traffic directly to your site. You can send that link out months in advance. You can promote it through that link. Um, and even if you have to kill your YouTube event and create a new one for whatever reason, they still have that website link. And then you can just replace the embed code if you ever need to. Just out of curiosity, sure. um, let's say I'm distributing a documentary mm -hmm. and I have a premiere in, in here and I want to have a premiere in Manila and Guatemala. Can I, can I do that with not just a live stream but also a film? You can. Uh, so that, you know, there's like a yeah. location premiere? Sure. Um, that's a really good question. Okay. I can look into it. I just yeah, I know that you can. I know that you can. You can choose a broadcast delay. I know that you could. I think I'm. I don't know that you could pump a video source in there. You can pump a video source in there through Wirecast, and we could show that. So you could essentially, yes, play your play your documentary okay. so within you Wirecast. It to people, but I to do that okay. Yeah, I think you could do that absolutely, and we'll talk a little bit about using video assets uh, in Wirecast. Okay. Um, promotions, this promote on my channel page when the event is live. That's going to throw it up in that banner uh, at, the, uh, at your YouTube channel page. Um, I'm going to go ahead and uncheck that because I don't want my face on there. Um, and promoting through in-video programming when the event is live, that's going to throw a banner on all of your other YouTube videos as you go live. So it's a kind of an additional source of promotion, which is pretty cool. Uh, you can add a location. You can add a recording date. I don't typically bother with that. Uh, again, we uncheck for the legislator. We don't want them to see those statistics, but that's totally your call. Um, recording, it used to be that it would, you, you could decide whether YouTube was going to record it and keep it. Uh, by default now, it just does keep it. It records it and it keeps it, which is actually pretty cool for up to four hours, I believe. Um, but you can check it to automatically make that private so that it essentially kind of disappears to any audience after you've ended your live stream. So they can watch it live and then it goes away. Um, which, again, it's a personal preference. Enabling DVR is exactly what it sounds like. It allows you to scrub through the video even though it's live. So if someone joins in live but they miss the beginning, they can jump back to the beginning. And that's for up to 12 hours, which is really pretty impressive. And again, here's you can, you can set that broadcast delay. I don't know why you'd want to do that. Like I said, there's already going to be a 40-second delay. Um, I don't really quite know what the, the benefit of that would be, but you never know, you might run into one. So I'm going to go ahead and click Create Event right there. This is where things start to get a little bit more technical, um, but it's really actually quite basic still. Um, this, you can add multiple cameras, and we're not going to get into that, uh, that 
it, it melts my brain to try and understand how YouTube deals with that. Um, I don't even really understand its function, so we're going to skip it. Um, this thumbnail right here, though, you can go ahead and add a thumbnail uh, that will be displayed uh, in your, uh, as your image uh, before your stream starts. You can choose your maximum sustained bit rate right here. We're going to choose basic ingestion. And this basically is determined on a number of things. It's determined on your video source and what size your video source is. It's determined by your bandwidth. So if you are streaming over 3G, you're probably going to want to choose that, that lowest uh, 300 kilobits a second. And that's going to be the safest. It's going to be the worst quality, but it'll be the safest for, for broadcast. Um, but if you have a really super fast fiber or cable connection, um, you can choose that full HD and it will actually stream in full HD. Um, the cool thing about that is if you have uh, enough uh, bandwidth to push out a full HD signal, YouTube worries about encoding it on the other end if they don't have enough bandwidth to receive that full HD signal. So you don't need to really worry about your viewer here. What you really need to worry about is what you can absolutely do. When I was creating this event, I was having trouble getting it to go through the wired network. We're actually streaming through our Wi-Fi, uh, which I would never recommend. But um, so what I did to compensate for that is I, I am streaming at this 500 kilobits a second uh, at 480p. 480p refers to the video resolution. So it's 720 by 480. Um, it's always that second number. Uh, it's, it's the... Uh, 2480, it's the, it's the height of the frame. Um, again, that depends uh, if what your camera, what signal you're sending. I'm just going to go ahead and set this up for 480 here as well. Kind of making sense so far? Does, that, does, the, does the bit rate kind of make sense to everybody? Really all the, that is, it's, it's how much data we're sending per second. Uh, and again, it's determined by your internet connection. Good. Also, um, you can choose your encoder right here. There's a couple different, uh, well, there's only two. Flash Media Live Encoder. Uh, there's a lot of different encoders, but uh, YouTube is currently only, uh, has these two preset options. Um, and since we're using Wirecast for YouTube, we're just going to go ahead and use that. Flash Media Live Encoder is another free option, but it's for streaming a single source. So if you have a switched feed, you can send that and stream, stream that directly. Or if you just are taking one little camera or whatever and not going to put any slides or anything in it. With the limits on Flash, too, would that be a limitation in terms of your audience, perhaps? No, a Flash Media Live Encoder may be a misleading name. Okay. And I would clarify it for you, but I'm not the person to do that. Okay, uh, no, because YouTube, uh, YouTube does not require Flash anymore, right. I believe. So, no, I mean, I so I think it's taking. I think it probably encodes it to flash and sends it out as something else would be my, yeah, it sends it out as H.264. Uh, so okay. anyway, you can check that out. Uh, you can do a little bit more. You, I don't know enough about it to really tell you honestly. Um, but for here, we can just go ahead and choose Wirecast for YouTube. If you're doing this at home, this right here is where you're going to download and install Wirecast for YouTube. These are all set up, so you don't need to do that. Um, but this is the only place, if you Google Wirecast for YouTube, you're going to be really frustrated and you're not going to find it anywhere. It's going to be really difficult to find. You have to go through creating a live event, and I think that's probably because um, not everybody has you know, live streaming privileges, so they probably want to keep it limited. So, But again, for Mac or Windows, which is nice of them. Um, you can enable closed caption captioning if you uh, have this supported vendor or software. Again, if you do, you probably know more about that um, than is worth going into right now. Good. So uh, after we've done that, we can go ahead and, and save our changes. This is going to take us to um, nowhere. We're going to go to the live control room next. This live control room is kind of where we're going to end. And we're going to revisit this uh, in a moment. But uh, you'll see uh, that it's not receiving any data from our encoder, and that's bad. That means it's not receiving anything. Uh, we're not sending it anything, obviously, so of course it's not. Uh, but once we get there, uh, we're going to be able to preview our stream and then start our stream. Um, but you can see right there it says no data, but you can see that we have set it up for 480p. So we're going to want to make sure to do the same thing in Wirecast. Uh, it gives us right here, if we were sending data, we could go ahead and preview it before we start our stream. Uh, and we could take a look at the public view, which we is a little bit misleading. It's about the same as the preview. 
um, whether or not whether or not you've made it public. So that's that. I think we should probably stop right here and go ahead and create our YouTube live events. So you can see at the, the page two there, um, we can go ahead and <coughs> log into YouTube. If you are not logged in as Denver Open Media, when you go to YouTube, would you please just flag one of us down and we'll get you logged in there. Um, yeah, so in your browser, just go ahead and go to YouTube.com. Okay, good. Thank you. <coughs> we should go. Oh, yeah, good. Look at that. How about that? <laughs> Magic. Good. Do you want to fire this up and try it? Oh, sure. Oh, sure. We'll make it easy. Maybe, if your computer's going to play nice. Not really play nice. How about we just have you jump on this one? Is that okay with you? That one is going to be moody. You can go ahead and uh, go to your video manager, and uh, which you've already done. Over on the left, you can find live events. And then you can go ahead and create your new event up on the top right. So uh, right here, we can drop that little guy down. We can name it whatever. And we can go to video manager. Yep, and name it whatever you want, your name, stream, or whatever. And then over here, live events. And new live event. Has everyone been able to create a new live event? Not yet. Good, uh, go right here, drop that down. You need to go to your video manager. Boom. And now you can choose live events, and up on the top right you'll see. I logged out, I was like, this is not me, someone forgot to log out, so. Well good, well thank you for doing that. Uh -huh. I'm gonna go ahead and log you out, is that okay? Yeah, by all means. Good, and I'm just gonna go ahead and go, boom. Whatever, allow. Cool, now you can. Everybody there, everybody created a new live event, top right. Do we all select the same bitrate setting view? Or? Yeah, why don't we go ahead and make it easy. If you, uh, if you choose 480, that'd be good. Uh, and if not, then do note what you've chosen. So it is downloaded? On every? It is, yes, uh huh, thank you. Yep. Yeah, if you'd set it all as unlisted in uh, in your info and settings tab, that'd be great. Uh, yeah, you could start it. At, why don't we start it? Yeah, sure. And you don't have to add an end time. I honestly don't ever add an end time, so I'm not sure if it kills it at that end time or not. But it's fine that you did. Uh, we're not going to be streaming for two hours. When it was under public, it had a share on Facebook or Twitter. Did it? Click it again. Huh. Will it stream it to either of those? Or is it just the link? I don't know, but now with the new video technology on Facebook. Yeah, the way it kind of plays yeah. as you're scrolling down. What, what page is that? Uh, no, public. it's info and settings. It's your first yeah. tab there. And if you do set it to public, I imagine you could check that. I don't know where it would send it with this account, but if your account is linked to Facebook or Twitter, oh, that's interesting. I bet it would. Which is pretty rad, particularly if you're doing all of your promotions through that. That is pretty cool. I haven't, I get so used to seeing those icons, I guess maybe I don't always <laughs> notice them. It's very cool. Yeah, I'd be curious to know what that does. I'll have to give it a go. Can we test it from, can I do that from here? Like it will, I don't know, there's not a Facebook account linked to that, I don't think. And if it's our Facebook account, I don't know if you want to be all over our, our Facebook. <laughs> I mean, if you want to, everyone will be watching you, your face as you click around. You can log out and go to my YouTube channel. Do you have live stream enabled on your YouTube channel? Uh, I don't know. 
Probably not. I know. Sorry. How do you, how do you enable it on your By applying for nonprofit. Oh, I have that. Oh, you do? You have yeah. Google for nonprofits? Uh -huh. Check it out. Log out. Log in as you or as your organization. Whatever has that Google for nonprofit status. Cool. So have we all kind of created our event and then the next step, whatever that is, go through those tabs up at the top? Looks like you guys have kind of figured out. If you wanted to check out advanced settings, no, you're great. So uh, you can go ahead and choose your, your, uh, your ingestion settings there. You can select a bit rate. And I would uh, go ahead and choose that and choose 480 just to keep things simple. You're there. Boom. I, di I did it as you were going. So <laughs> Sweet. Oh, you've been there. You're like, come on, yeah. man, hurry up. Good, good, good. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, perfect, good. You can just hit save changes if you haven't already. It looks like you already did. And then you can go to your live control room. And then in your live control, in your live control room, you can choose your bit rate. Good, yeah, this is perfect. So this is kind of all up to you, this advanced setting stuff. It's kind of totally up to you, so you can go ahead and create your event. So it also does Google Plus, too, for that one. Huh. Yeah, let's choose 480. Good, and you can, it looks like it was successfully saved, so you can go to your live control room. Perfect. So again, you're going to see that big red banner right across there when uh, we're not receiving data from your encoder. But we're going to solve that problem here in just a couple of minutes. So I mentioned uh, that we're streaming over a wireless uh, connection. Uh, that's because I was crunched for time. And normally, I would have made absolutely positively sure that I was plugged in through like an Ethernet cable. Um, I don't, you don't want to stream over a wireless connection, particularly if you're streaming at an event or something and then everyone gets on that wireless network and like bogs it down and it's just, it's one more variable and there are so many variables as you're live streaming, you want to eliminate as many of those as possible. So I recommend that you always stream over a wired internet connection. Uh, yep, yeah, you, after you create your event. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yep. Good, and then 480. I got a question for you about sure, this, please. Uh, this captioning. Will this service actually provide captioning, and how do, how do they do that? Um, no, uh, no. So you can, you can have a caption provider and a device uh, that actually will stream captions live. I don't know how it works. I have no idea how it works, honestly. It's, it's a mystery to me. I should really learn. Um, but it is an option. It's something that you can do. What is cool about YouTube, however, is after it's uploaded, you can turn the captions on, and it'll translate it into, like I think, f f I don't even know how many different languages they have. But it will, it will caption it, and it will translate it after, it's, after the event is complete. Yeah, and that, so that's a really a great tool or service. Um, but again, if you, if you really needed to look into live captioning, um, it is an option and we're trying to explore it right now with one of our government clients trying to figure that out. Cool. All right, let's, uh, let's jump into, uh, I'm going to go ahead and jump into Wirecast here, I believe. Let me make sure that I'm following this so that we don't confuse you if you want to return to this document later. Good. So hopefully you have uh, Wirecast already open there on your computer, but uh, you don't need to do it right now. We're going to do sort of the same thing as step through some of this uh, and then revisit it. Oh, uh, I, I want to mention that there are, uh, there are three versions of Wirecast currently available. Uh, obviously, the free one is going to be the most stripped down. It's the, ba the most basic. You're not going to be able to switch between multiple cameras. But you can have one camera, and you can have graphics, and you can uh, take a, a, a computer screen that's on your network. Um, you can 
roll in video and audio, you can't control the playback of those things. So you have to hit it when you're ready to go and it'll play all the way through. Um, which is a, a little bit tricky, but it, it's still functional, still totally works, and it's still totally free, which is awesome. Uh, the next version uh, has a few more features, uh, but uh, I don't honestly know the, the intermediate version's hang-ups. I know that the intermediate version won't necessarily stream HDV, uh, which is actually what you're going to run into with the free version as well. So we have these cameras here that you can check out from OMF, and they come out FireWire, which is what we're doing here. We're going FireWire into a Thunderbolt adapter. So we have two, uh, two cameras going straight into there via FireWire. Um, which works well for us. Nice, nice, nice. They're good. That's good. Good demonstration. Uh, so that wor it works for us. Uh, but it wouldn't work necessarily for this. I think it'll say unrecognized HDV device. Uh, so what you'd have to do, the solution is you turn the camera, uh, you put it into standard def, and then you can send a standard def signal. Uh, so there, there, yeah, there is a workaround. Um, I don't know, I mean, try HD first and see if it's going to recognize that signal. If, if, if it doesn't, then you know, and you can switch it to standard def and it should recognize it. Uh, I'm sure there's a money reason behind that. So, but again, it's free, so we are willing to find workarounds. All right, um, that's kind of, uh, Again, uh, it's, I think it's $500, I think, for the pro version. I think, actually, they just released a new version. Uh, we're not on the latest version here, but uh, uh, it might be a little closer to six, I think, 695. So we've created our event here in YouTube, and we're going to go ahead and um, connect our camera, which we're going to use these built-in eyesight on, on the IMAX here, uh, so you don't need to do any connecting. I, however, may have to. Let's see if it's, if it's working. Uh, you're going to notice, I want to go over a little bit of, uh, I'm not going to talk too much about our settings on our, on our Z5U, but that, that page goes into it a little bit. I want to talk about the layout a little bit. So if you're looking at Wirecaster, you can look at it up here. Uh, you can see that it's going to be split into two main sections, and you're going to see that live broadcast area. So that's, whatever you see there is what is being streamed to the public. Um, so if you don't want to see what you're seeing there, if you don't want anyone to see what you're seeing there, you might want to not click it. <laughs> you might want to not put it in there. And then the bottom uh, section there is, is the main shot list. And we're going to go over a little bit more about what that means. But um, in the layout menu, you can see uh, uh, some, some options that are, that are grayed out to really only the, the, uh, the studio version or the pro version. Um, same with these layers, uh, so I'm not really going to spend a lot of time talking about any of those, um, but just know they add an extra layer of complexity as well as some, some function. Um, to the right, you're going to see your master audio meter right there. Um, so when we start sending an audio signal to Wirecast, we're going to see our meters will start bumping. Um, which is a good way to monitor your audio, though I would always make sure that you're wearing headphones so that you can really listen to your audio to make sure it sounds like what you think it sounds like. You're going to see a speaker and a pair of headphones below that. If you turn that speaker off, it mutes everything. It mutes the entire broadcast. So that means there's no audio going to YouTube. That's basically what that means if you turn that speaker off. However, if you click these little headphones and they, they're not making that little sound picture anymore, you turn that off, that means um, you're still broadcasting the sound, but you're not hearing it in your headphones, which is good if you want to maybe like jump over and monitor your stream and make sure that it sounds OK on the streaming end. So you might want to like turn your headphones off and not hear it here, but uh, you want to hear it playing back on YouTube. Does that kind of make sense to everybody? Cool. So um, I think that's most of the layout. First thing we're going to want to do is set our uh, canvas size. I'm going to go ahead and go to broadcast up at the top, canvas size. And remember, we chose that 480p. So you want this to match whatever you've set up in YouTube. So we're going to go ahead and choose 480p. And you'll see the canvas size adjusts accordingly. Next thing we want to do is add a shot. Um, 
shots in Wirecast, they can be anything. They could be images, they could be videos or cameras, another desktop or a portion of your own desktop. Uh, you can even have audio shots. Basically, anything that you're going to cut to or use in Wirecast is going to be referred to as a shot. So you'll see that toolbar that separates the, um, the broadcast area from this uh, main shot list. And this, uh, this toolbar right here is where you add anything into that main shot list. So first we're going to uh, want to add a camera, obviously. So we're going to hit that. Uh, of course, mine's not plugged in. But if you guys drop that down, you should be able to see built in, what is it? HD camera? Yeah. So what that's going to do is that's going to create a little shot of your face right there. Um, I'm going to try and plug this in really quickly just for the sake of it. So you, uh, you can see there's probably a couple different options. There's probably an audio option. Don't add the audio yet. We're going to get into that in a second. You're just going to want to add the video. So obviously, uh, the first step is, before you do any of this, you're probably going to want to plug in your cameras. Otherwise, it's probably not going to recognize it. But we're lucky this time it did. So I'm going to go ahead and add my video shot. It's nice, isn't it? Boom. So once we, we've done that, uh, we're going to kind of go through uh, what adding other shots looks like. Um, and you'll notice if you click that, it puts it into the broadcast area. Yeah. Um, so again, if you don't want people to be seeing this, we're not, we're not broadcasting yet, but if we were broadcasting, whatever's in there is going to show up on your stream. Good. So uh, next we're going to add, what do we want to add? I'm going to skip the part about the Z5U because again, those are our HDV cameras and you can refer to this if you do check out one of those and you want to add that. I want to go ahead and add an audio shot. So if we go ahead and click this, uh, mine is this Logitech audio camera audio shot. I think yours is probably going to be face to, or eyesight. Uh, if you go ahead and click add. Mm -hmm. Add, right add built-in microphone shot, yes. Okay. So uh, what that does is now we should probably be seeing some uh, meter action, maybe? Maybe not. Oh, click on it. Yeah, so if you select that shot, you're going to start to see your, your meter bouncing around. Now you'll notice that doesn't really do us a lot of good if we want to broadcast ourselves talking. It's not going to help, right? Because, because the, the clip is not enabled, the microphone clip is not enabled while we're looking at our video shot. Is that making sense to you? So if you go back to your video shot, you're going to notice that, uh, I can do it here too, you're going to notice that they're not connected. So I'm looking, I'm broadcasting my face, right? Um, but there's no audio level. But if I click this, oh, the microphone shot. Oh, that's cool. I'm not going to do that too much. Um, but, you'll, you'll, but then I'm not sending my face, right? So like, what the hell? So what you have to do is you have to select your camera. And over here on the right, that little microphone guy, uh, you add your audio source. It'll say microphone for you. So does that make sense? You have to attach an audio source to your video source. Mm -hmm. And again, we're going to go through all this again. So if you don't get there, that's fine. We're going to come back and give everybody time to get there. So you, you might be bored if you get there later, but we'll try and keep you excited. <laughs> so does that, is that concept making sense to everybody? Um, and the best way, I want to talk a little bit about audio. Uh, the best way to get your audio in, in my personal opinion, using this setup is going to be going directly into your camera. So for instance, over here what we've done is we have a wireless mic going one into each camera. So when Tony was talking, we had both signals going in. Um, and you can uh, tie both signals to your video source, right? Um, and that's the best way to do it, I think, because that ensures that the audio data is traveling at the same rate 
as your video data so that by the time it gets into Wirecast, it's not out of sync, which means hopefully then by the time it gets to YouTube, it's, it's still in sync as well. So for instance, if, we, if instead of doing that, if I took like this microphone and I put it into a mixer and then I took that mixer and I did it as a direct input into the iMac, odds are that audio is going to get there before the video gets there or after. My guess is going to be it's going to get there before because it's less data. So that audio will beat the video and I'm going to be out of sync. So you'll hear me and then you'll see my mouth moving, which I was going to try and demonstrate just there, but I, I realized I can't do that. So the rule of higher microphone quality in video does not apply to this situation? No, you still want like the best quality microphone or, or the best proximity, you know. Right. The, Quality is probably secondary to proximity. Uh, for instance, the, the onboard mics there on that camera are, are probably just about as good as this lapel mic, but the difference is it's way over there. So, so proximity of your microphone is probably the primary concern. Okay. Secondary would be quality, and then I'd really be concerned about how you're getting your microphone into your computer. Right. So again, ideally you're going in through your computer and then it's taking the audio and video data from either FireWire or USB <coughs> or however it's so getting there. So the microphone is directly connected to the computer? Uh, to the camera. To, right. To the computer that has the camera in it. In this instance, <laughs> your computer has the camera in it. Right. So yeah. if you were doing something like this, a direct plug-in would be OK? Probably. Okay. Test it. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I still run into sync issues for absolutely no reason at all that I have to chase around. Um, and the, the, the advanced, the, the pro version of Wirecast allows you to delay it by a few milliseconds, but it's really hardly ever enough, so I have to chase the problem and rethink what I'm doing. So um, again, and I, I encourage anybody that's going to use this, test the heck out of it before you get in there and you're gonna start doing it, because you might find that you do run into sync issues for, for no reason that you have to chase around. I don't really wanna complicate things, but um, uh, it, no, I'm going to skip it. Uh, it's different, different video cables are going to get there at different rates too. So if you're having issues, if you're going USB 2, but you have the option to go FireWire, you might want to try FireWire to get, get your video signal into there. Uh, likewise, HDMI is much faster than FireWire. So again, lots of different options. Experiment, play with it, do a lot of testing before you're ready to do this. <coughs> Audio make pretty good sense to everybody here so far. Um, let's talk about adding media shots. Uh, same way, uh, except the little button next to it, that little picture, or that little piece of paper. You can go in here and you can add, obviously, video, picture, or music. I'm going to go ahead and choose picture, because that's what this document tells me to do. Um, you'll find on your desktop, I don't know if I have them here. Oh, look, I think I do. Uh, in desktop, in the class assets, live streaming for nonprofits. We've set up some media there for you to go ahead and import. Um, I'm going to choose this uh, closing still, or uh, rather this opening still. These all have the wrong date on them, so sorry about that. It's definitely not December anymore. We missed Christmas. Um, yeah. <laughs> so uh, you'll see that that adds a media shot. So obviously you can add 40 of these, if you have, what, I, what we end up doing often is we'll take a PowerPoint and we'll export all of those slides as JPEGs and then we can throw the PowerPoint slide in here so that we can have a camera and, and then we can have the presenter referring to the slide and as they're referring to the slide, we can take the slide so you know that you're not trying to film the slide because that never really works on a projector very well. So it's obviously pretty simple. And you notice you're probably already getting the hang of how this program works. It's really simple. You click it, and it takes whatever you're clicking on, um, which is pretty cool. We're going to go into uh, other ways to do it, too. But um, same deal with uh, if, you, if you do that same thing and add a music shot. This is going to get really loud and annoying in here, so everyone be prepared as we add these music shots. Uh, class assets. Uh, the opening music is really pretty, pretty epic. Um, and you'll notice as you click it, it starts to go. And you can see the night gives us a nice little countdown there, which is pretty cool. Actually, I wonder if that's a new feature. I never noticed that. Um, so, and one, and we're out. So then you can switch to it again. 
So, but you'll notice you can't really control whether it's playing or stopping or going or, which is a little bit infuriating, but um, you can kind of get the hang of it. I'm going to stop doing that now. Um, it's it, and video works the exact same way. Uh, if you want, you can go ahead and do the same thing and add a video shot. I know. I wanted you all to be inspired by the power of live streaming. I, I hope it worked. Uh, again, with the video opening animation, it does the same thing. And, um, you know, if you wanted to, these are the same length, so what you could do is tie that opening music. Uh, remember our little microphone, our little speaker guy over there? You could tie, you could link, uh, you could, if you select your opening animation shot and you choose that speaker, you can choose your opening music so that every time, every time you click, every time you switch to that wow. open media, it plays the logo or the anime, the music, essentially, it ought to. Yeah, very exciting. Yeah, and we're going to talk a little bit more. There's a ton of them. We're going to get into that here in just a minute. So you get it. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, so you said the microphone is connected to the camera. So when that is the case, and I'm not using this microphone, do you have to sync up an audio, or does it automatically come through? The you, still, you, still have to, uh, you still have to tell it. For instance, like right here, uh, I'm using my Logitech microphone and my Logitech video, right? I, I just have a little st stupid webcam. And uh, if I just click that, uh, my shots over here, you can see that it still has a Logitech camera audio shot and it still has a, a Logitech video shot. So you still ha it, it will separate them out. Does that make sense? So when, you're, but when you begin live streaming, mm -hmm. you have the shots, how do you connect external microphone to the video image if it's not connected to the computer? What I do is I run it into the camera. That's what I do. I take my, my mic and I run it into the camera. Right. You, you could also run it into a mixer and directly into your computer, but beware of those, the potential for sync issues. Am I, I'm not answering your question, am I? Tell me again. So you have to, like here, you have to <coughs> You have a camera, mm -hmm. and then you said you have to add a microphone. Yep, you have there. to choose that built-in mic. Yep. So if that's if I'm not using built-in, but you're using an external mic, right? Do I have to? You would choose Linen. Yeah, it would it would probably show up as Linen would be my guess, um, or maybe you'd have to add it over here. So you'd have to click that and add your Linen add built-in input shot. So you'd add that, and that would be your audio shot. So if you had a microphone going directly into your you, But if computer, I don't, because it's going into the camera. That's what I'm asking. It's going to show up like it shows up on the screen right there in that Logitech, so it has audio and video. OK. If you're going into the camera. OK. Did that answer it? Yes. I just wanted, yeah, I didn't know if, if it went to the camera, if it wasn't going to show up on here. No, it'll show up just like that. OK. Mm -hmm. Uh, if, if it detects your camera as having both audio and video capabilities, it's going to show up as two separate things. Gotcha. Thank you. Cool. So I feel like most everybody's added that. I'm going to give you guys a few minutes to go ahead and add any shots that you want to, uh, and then we're going we're gonna to move on to, I don't know, other stuff. Oh, before I go there, we can start messing with this. This is fun. Um, you can add a desktop. Let's see. 18. So you can see that I have uh, added computer 18. That's you over there. You're the lucky winner <laughs> in black over there. I can see we're looking at her desktop right now. I know, I know. Pretty exciting. <laughs> so you can add. Uh, you can add if they're on the same network. Once you've launched that desktop presenter, you click on that little computer, and then you can do desktop. I think it's launch desktop presenter as the top option. And once you do that, then it will see any computers on the network, and uh, you can broadcast a portion of their screen or their entire screen. Uh, and it's kind of fun. 
It's kind of cool. Right now, uh, in the live stream that we're sending, uh, I think probably uh, Robbie over there has been taking shots of my desktop as we're going along. Awesome. So that's an, another cool option. So play with that. If you if you open up Desktop Presenter, you're going to notice that you get uh, this little this little screen right here. And I'm not going to mess with this because it'll mess with the stream. But you can choose whether you want to focus on a window or just this VX, which I believe is my monitor. Um, or you can do a select a screen region or a, a, a specific size or whatever. Um, so you can kind of play with that and uh, get a feel for that. I don't know. I think I broke it. There we go. Did this die? No. Do you want to try it? Add a few shots? Not really. Okay, good. I won't make you. I promise <laughs> I won't make you. I won't make you. Uh, yeah, it, it's, it's surprising. Once you get kind of the feel for it, no matter your technology, uh, comfortability, you're going to learn that it's actually pretty simple. I know, I know, I'm sorry. So, but are we kind of getting a sense of it? Any questions as we're? How do you get it? Whoever learned the most is And you? I have this, but where do I, how do I get it up here? Uh, did you add a shot? No. Uh, click here and then do add desktop <laughs> shot. So you can choose someone else's computer. So like you could add the, the learning lab shot and you're going to get that. Maybe if it shows up in theory. Could be because everyone maybe other people are doing that. And that could be why it's freaking out. But you should be able to add yeah, choose that one, sure. There we go. Learning lab one, I think that's over there. So and they're gonna determine what part of their screen that you're gonna see. Uh, with this window, just like if you were to choose oh, so this is me selecting what, what I allow people to Exactly right. What you're focusing on. I mean, you can add your own. I think you can add your own. That's why we can see what number are you? 10. So if you click that and click, I think you should be able to choose Learning Lab 10. Yeah. So that's your own screen, um, which you can, you know, you can choose a portion of it. Yeah, exactly. So if you wanted as part of your presentation or whatever to. view your website or something, you can take a screenshot of it. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, keep in mind that your selections, you know, it stays. So whatever, whatever. You, so if you scroll, it's not, obviously not going to scroll with your window. But yeah. And then you go back to whatever. Yeah, exactly. What are some of the other uses? I mean, any kind of presentation or uh, tech presentations, honestly, is probably the most common. Um, if you wanted to show a PowerPoint in your live stream. You could do it that way. I find it's better to just export them. Maybe a Prezi. Have you ever seen uh, Prezi's where they're the kind of the animated PowerPoints? If you wanted to do that, that might be a good use. You could, you know, square up on a little on a, a window playing your Prezi and you could play that um, because there'd be no other way to get it in there, I don't think. So, yeah. That's a good question. You're, I mean, the, I suppose, Anyone with a really solid imagination could come up with some better answers <laughs> about how to use best okay. use that. Cool. Are we all pretty comfortable with that? We can talk a little bit. Yeah. Uh, so it seems like it froze on a teacher shot. On this. I don't want to go to it because there's other live stream. Oh yeah. Uh, click. Uh, click this. So it's stuck on that? Yeah. OK. Uh, I know there's a way. I'm sure there's a way. I don't know if it would be available with the free version. Um, I think you can add. Uh, 
we need to be able to be on and say, hey, welcome to the webinar. We're going to turn it over to our speaker who is sitting who knows where at the house probably. You can connect. Yeah, I, I know that you can with the pro version, and I haven't done it. Um, so I'm not really sure. I think this presenter probably. I think you can add their IP address and it will connect to their computer and if they're running Wirecast as well. I would imagine they would have to be running Wirecast as well. Uh, and that would be my guess about how to do that. Sorry, I don't have a better answer. I know that it is possible. The uh, other, alternatively, you could probably um, use uh, Skype or Hangouts. Yeah. Thank you. Good. So we're going to uh, kind of bust through this pretty quickly. We have about 40 minutes. Um, we have adding a desktop presenter. Uh, we have selecting our audio. Oh, this is kind of cool. The, I always forget to talk about this. The, uh, the shot templates over here, you can go ahead and if you've selected one of your shots, uh, for instance, I'll just go ahead and use my camera. I go over here and I choose the little box within a box button and I do side by side, for instance. It's going to put us, yeah, it is really cool. And then you can go ahead and choose, I think it's this one, yeah. You can choose your sources in that big open box. So I say I want uh, B to be my opening still. Uh, so that's a really, really cool, you know, it's a cool tool. And they give you a lot of, uh, a lot of different free options here. That's a good one for maybe if you're, you know, doing a presentation and you want the, either the, the speaker in the lower right or whatever. Um, in the in the uh, pro version, you can like manipulate these a little bit more. I could, you know, spin that that lower picture in the picture and shrink it and uh, and do whatever uh, in the pro version. But this is still quite a lot of powerful options for different types of presentations. So um, if you select your shot. Uh, for instance, I just selected my camera shot. Over on the right, I chose this little box within a box, and then I chose, you can choose any of those, uh, whichever ones. Um, is that making sense? Is it working? Yeah, that is so cool. And then the open box is how you set your sources. So that's pretty rad. Obviously, there are a lot of useful things for that. OK, I want to cut. just talk a little bit about cutting, which you've already been doing. You've all been cutting between multiple shots. Um, but I just want to talk about it, because there's a couple different ways you can do it. You'll notice that above our, our toolbar, we have these, uh, these transitions that we can choose. So I've just been clicking, and it's been doing this, what they call smooth, um, which I don't particularly care for. Um, as it is uh, kind of, it kind of fades it out and then it fades it back in, which I don't really like. I totally froze this, so I'm going to close it. Oh, nope, nope, don't close. It came back, it's alive, okay. Um, so you, you can see that, uh, maybe I'm just going to delete that real quick. Uh, it does that, it does that kind of... <laughs> slow dip thing, which isn't really my favorite. But as you can see, if you just choose, you can just drop that down and choose how you want it to cut. I always prefer um, simple. So like a dissolve is my normal preference if I'm going to be dissolving at all. And then you can choose the speed of your dissolve over on the right by clicking that little stopwatch. Um, or you can just cut. You know, the, there is one really super, super cool one. Um, come on, computer. Which is it? Flash? I think Flash is on there. Yeah, Flash is really, really, really exciting. Yeah, bang. You can change, change the speed of that. You can make it really slow, so it's super epic. And do that. And we'll just do the slow fizzle star action. Whoa! I know. 
It's really exciting. Really spice up your nonprofit presentations with that business. So anyway, you get the sense of it. You can, you can choose the different kind of cuts or dissolves you want to make. Um, again, I'm kind of a firm believer in less is more normally. So for the most part, I'll be cutting or if I really want to, if I want to like exit off of my opening slate, for instance, um, I would choose that and then I'd just choose a dissolve and do like a, a medium paste dissolve to get rid of that to cut to my, my, uh, my camera. Um, and that was too slow for me, but you get the idea. I like it to be a little bit less because uh, I think more is distracting, but it's all, it's all up to you. You guys are in charge. So um, you'll notice that as we're clicking them, they go immediately. The next thing I want to talk about is it's called Auto Live. It's that little green light right next to the Go button. If you turn that off, it's going to pop this little message up and then say it's for advanced usage. Uh, yeah, okay. Um, so, but now you'll notice that as you're clicking around on your different shots, it's not doing anything. It's not going until you click go. There's a little, the little green button right there next to auto live, or next to go. It's called auto live. I, uh, whatever, whenever I'm doing, and I think Robbie is probably streaming this way right now, that little green light is off. So that means what you can do is you can set up your shot. So rather than, say I wanted to make this camera shot a picture in a picture, if we had that little green light on um, and I, I have to click it in order to select it to make it a picture in a picture, but what happens, it sends it to the broadcast. So you want to be able to make mistakes or jiggle things. Right, I, I, I do, exactly. I want to be able to tweak things, okay. so I turn that off. And now if I wanted to make a picture in a picture but stay on that live streaming graphic, then I would be able to go ahead and add that, make that a picture in a picture, and uh, you know whatever. Do make choose my sources. Say I wanted that uh, opening still to just shrink down that way, um, and do kind of a dissolve. And now I'm already I set that up right. I can even <laughs> set my audio sources to whatever I want them to be, and then now I can hit go and it'll go. So is that, that's better for kind of on the fly, maybe questions and answers, etc., as opposed to like a presentation. I, I, I like, I have control issues, okay. so I want to be able to control everything. I don't want it to just go when I click it. Okay. So I always do that. I think Command G. Yeah, Command, no, I don't know. Yes, Command G. Yeah, Command G is the shortcut uh, to, to go. Um, again, I just, I like to be able to set all my shots. I don't want to, and I get really click happy sometimes, especially like in a live streaming situation. You could be really, really stressed out because you just had like seven things malfunction and you barely got everything up in the nick of time or whatever. And then I just get over here and I'm like clicking on every stupid thing. Uh, and it, it, especially when you're troubleshooting or you're distracted, totally your preference, but I prefer to turn auto life off. Yes. Okay. Yes. So if you uh, don't, forget that, don't forget that, or if you cut to a slide, thank you for bringing it up. If you cut to a slide, you're going to lose audio and be like, what the heck? It's because you didn't. Yeah, if you didn't set your audio source to your slide. There's a workaround in the pro version, as the pro version has uh, layers over here, so you can stack layers. So normally, like what I do is I'll just put my audio source on one layer and I'll leave it on the entire time and I'll maybe mute it if I need to. Um, and that's for the pro version. But for this instance, in this version, you do this need. Is the this is the free version. Uh huh. Yeah, it does a lot for being free, right? So we're not going to complain about having to add audio shots to all of our slides. Notice that it uh, does. It gets. It gets a little bit buggy if you have 50 slides and you're attaching audio sources to all of them. It starts to bog down. It does get a little slow. So. Just be aware. Test it before you, you set out to use it. Make sure your computer can handle it. Oh, we haven't even broadcast yet. It's 5 o'clock, and we haven't even started broadcasting. What the heck? So let's do it. Uh, again, we already choose, we chose our broadcasts, our canvas size. We already set that. Um, what you can do is you can just click on this little satellite dish, which I think is super antiquated. Someone should tell them to fix that. 
So if you choose that, um, we should be all set up to go to YouTube, and you go ahead and hit uh, choose your, your encoder. I actually don't think you need to do that. Let's just hit authenticate. I think it'll do it for us. Um, now it's going to ask you for that Denver Open Media password. It should hopefully remember it from when we did it earlier. If it doesn't, if you just shoot your hand up right now, uh, if it's not working for you, and we'll come log you in. It should be Ann. Oh, I'm sorry. You click on the little satellite dish. It's going to open this other thing. It's, after you click on this satellite dish, it opens this broadcast settings panel. You go ahead and click authenticate. It's going to open this Google. It looks like it's broadcasting. Did we, how are we already, did we already do this? No. How are we all broadcasting? Yeah, uh, so if you are currently broadcasting, <laughs> where's that emergency symbol? <laughs> I'm really concerned about where it might be broadcasting to, but I'm not going to stress myself out right now. Huh? Uh, it, there are little like rays coming out of your satellite yeah, dish. No, we don't know where it's going. So go ahead and stop that. No. What? I wonder what. It's fine. As long as it's, you guys might be on Thornton Channel 8 right now. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Hopefully you're not on Thornton Channel 8. So if you are, if you are, if you do have little microwaves coming out of your broadcast thing, turn that off for me. Oh, I know. I know. I know. It's cool. Yeah, you're going to the correct. Well, no, we don't know. So I want to tell you. Okay. Can you get the two audios at the same time? Yeah. Opening music, and then you can also talk over the music. Exactly right. You can put as many audio, as many shots as you add with this guy. So any kind of audio shot that you add with that left, you can put them all on there. Uh huh. And again, the more you, the more you add, the the more complicated it's going to get. So. Uh, Let's see what we did here. I'm just kidding. Um, yeah, hopefully we're not going to Thornton Channel 8. Oh, good. Well, cool. Well, OK, so uh, <laughs> I haven't gotten a phone call yet, so we must be OK. No, I, I think there's like seven Thornton Channel 8 events, so I'm sure it's fine. Um, so let's go, let's go ahead and go into our broadcast menu up at the top there. And we'll figure out how to do this a little bit differently. Um, I think if we just open that, uh, sorry guys. Trickery. Just go ahead and choose that broadcast settings. Um, choose authenticate, like I said, uh, to do. It warned me that there was a broadcast in process. Oh, sweet. Well, go ahead and choose Ann Antice there at Denver Open Media if you haven't. Yeah, good. Uh, scroll, and you're going to have to scroll down a little bit and choose accept. So, <coughs> again, we're going to hit authenticate. It's going to pull this up. Let's choose Antice, and then scroll down and hit accept. Okay, uh, authenticate. Mm -hmm. And then you are already going to answer. So scroll down and then choose accept. No, 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 no. We're not broadcasting yet. We were doing that earlier, but I wonder. I really, really am curious. I'll send you guys the links to wherever we were broadcasting. No, I don't. I don't think you can, you can't send more than one signal to a place. I don't. One of us was lucky. One of us. So, but then if you if you choose that uh, where it says event, you can choose that. Uh, uh, you can choose your event, your name. <laughs> Good. Someone just lost their job. I'm going to go ahead and choose mine. <laughs> it should say format 480. Uh, if that's what you chose, it should automatically know that that's what you want to do. Now we can go ahead and hit save. And now we can hit broadcast. And you're not. No, choose your name, the one you created. 
Sorry. So the one you created earlier should show up? Oh, there it is. That must yep. be me. Cool. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. And so did you choose? Uh, go back over here. Uh, to YouTube, I'm sorry. Click on that. that uh, yeah. No, my computer died. Uh, go back to info and settings. Yeah, unlisted. OK. Uh, and then go to ingestion settings. Yeah, 240. I just wanted to make sure that it was yeah. reading it correctly. Here, Good. Because so, my computer crashed. I did that just because, you know, before I. Perfect. Yeah, thank you. Uh, it shouldn't matter because YouTube should already have that event. Uh, so, oh, because you're logged into our YouTube, right? Yeah. No, I'm logged into. N no, you're, my you're logged into. And so go ahead and hit authenticate again. Oh, that's why. Okay. Yeah, and then uh, choose that drop down. Sign out and then sign in as yours. Are you signing in as mm -mm. you? Yeah, okay, good. So just scroll down and hit accept. You can, yeah, there you go. Good, and now you can choose your. And then save? Yeah. Okay, so if you have microwaves emitting and you have the correct settings, good. Hit your broadcast button. Yeah, scroll up. Uh, go to live control room. Good. So now we should all see this uh, preview option. We should be able to choose preview. Why don't we, if you hit preview streaming, it just it takes a little too long. Oh, I'm sorry. I meant the other preview. You can go ahead and close that. I meant the preview in, uh, uh, in on your YouTube, uh, on your YouTube in your browser. There we go. Okay. Easy for me to say. Yeah. So if you're if you're in your browser and you're looking at the live control room, you should be able to hit. Okay, got it. Okay. I have an ingestion setting issue. Got it. Oh, there's not any more. Good. Yeah, so now you can hit preview there. So we should be previewing our stream. Is everybody that wants to be there there? We have. Okay, good. Yep, you hit preview. Yep, so now we have to just kind of wait. YouTube takes its, its time to give you the option to start streaming after you click preview. So hopefully they're going to let us all do this right now. You may need to refresh your page, perhaps, maybe, to get that to show up. Again, sometimes it just takes a little while. Why don't we try and refresh? There we go. Start streaming. Good. Uh, yeah, we may not see it on the public view. Why don't you go ahead and uh, refresh this page? Oh, so nerdy. And we're, we're just waiting for this start streaming button to like come to life. Sometimes, like again, uh, maybe now if you try to preview. Bam. Uh, try this. And again, like uh, YouTube is really, really great. This is a free service. This is really, really awesome. You're going to run into little snags like this, like you can't, for some reason, start streaming, and you don't know why, and it's taking forever. Be patient. We're going to figure it out. Uh, did you already hit preview? It, well, it, yeah, it won't. Oh, share you're not the receiving same issues I any data. And I don't know how I got mine to work. Uh, 480. So why don't you go ahead and hit, uh, turn this off. This is my actual YouTube channel. And go, go to broadcast settings. Uh, choose your event again. Oh, good, Don't it already did. Uh, go ahead and hit authenticate again. <laughs> good, scroll down and hit accept. And choose your event again. Good, and hit save. And then let's look at our uh, uh, broadcast menu and then uh, canvas size. Good, and that's right. OK, so let's uh, just try and hit broadcast again. Well, this is unlisted, so um, I'll just go out of it. Oh, look at analytics. 
Uh, give this a minute and we'll see if it comes back around. Look, there we go. Now you can hit preview. We probably didn't change anything. We just stopped it and started it again. It, it's so you can look and see how many people are watching. Are watching. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Good. Is everybody that wants to be streaming, streaming? No, why not? I'm just kidding. Start streaming. Boom. Now you are. Any minute now you are. We're so close. I kept pushing that. It wasn't working. It's because I could, came and stood over here. It's like a mechanic. Yep. Let's see what's on your screen. You might have a black, black screen. No, no, no. Uh, go ahead and uh, refresh this, or you can click view and watch page. There you go. Ta-da! <coughs> Live streaming is fun. And again, you'll notice there's probably about a 45 second delay. Yep. Uh, the delay is sometimes a little yeah. bit less when you're streaming at a lower bit rate. Um, but YouTube, they recently, well, I guess not that recently, a few months ago updated their platform. And it used to be there was almost like little to no, almost like 12 seconds delay or less. Um, but with this new platform, for some reason, I don't know if it's their content ID system going through it, there's a pretty much a minimum of a 45 second delay no matter what you do. It caught me looking really confused. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Oh, I hope uh, I hope Thornton saw that yeah. look too. I'm sure they did. <laughs> I'm really, 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 really. What time is it? So I can know. Good. I, I know I can go back and uh, look. Oh, I wanted to mention also. Uh, there's that little next to broadcast. There's that little record button. Uh, you don't need to click it. You can take my word for it. That will record your stream to your hard drive, as an FLV <coughs> or F4V. FLV. Oh, uh, well, you are a part of that computer forever. Okay. So, That's great. It, uh, yeah, and Thornton. So, yeah, it does, it will record. You should note that if, you are, if you're broadcasting as well as recording, you may run into uh, uh, one of the bit rates may be degraded. So it might do one or the other. Usually the second one, it'll do the second stream because essentially you're streaming to YouTube and you're streaming to your hard drive. It'll do the second stream sometimes at a lower bit rate depending on your network and your, your computer resources. So know that if you're doing that, it may reduce the quality of the one that, the second one that you do. Does that make sense? Also uh, I don't I have not personally ever relied on that file that it creates. I can't speak to its quality. I'm sure. It, I mean, it's highly compressed. Um, even if it's if you're if you're streaming in HD, it's gonna it's still gonna be compressed. So, my recommendation is if you have the option, run tapes in your cameras uh, as as a resource or as a as a final. Also, though, keep in mind that YouTube is storing it. Yeah. So essentially, if you're if you're running tapes and you're recording and you're at YouTube, that's three backups of your stream that you have happening right at the same time. Did you have a question? No, I'm just, when I, because I used my own account, mm -hmm. and it gave me the option of clicking Facebook, Google Plus, and Twitter. All those fed this into that stream, except Facebook, I haven't figured out yet. But my Google Plus shows and Twitter has a link and a watch. That nice. You drop down in your Twitter feed and watch it all. Cool. That's awesome. Really cool to know. Thank you. Cool. OK, so now we're live streaming experts, right? Right. Yeah. Awesome. You guys can go spread your words <coughs> like little word spreading things. Uh, if you <laughs> in order to stop your broadcast, you can just stop that broadcast. You can just click that little microwave satellite antenna dealy bob, and it will stop your broadcast. Um, also, you may want to you may want to think about this though. You may want to stop streaming on YouTube first because if you stop streaming on YouTube first, it'll say this event is is over. This event has ended. However, if you stop streaming on Wirecast first, it'll say we've encountered an error. So you may want to stop streaming on YouTube first. Not a big deal either way, but we don't like people being told that there are errors if there are, in fact are not errors. Um, this is about Google Analytics. Oh shoot. <laughs> if you could just anytime it says anything, just assume it says live stream. <laughs> <laughs>
So yeah, I'm, I'm passing out a training survey. If everyone could fill that out, it would be much appreciated. I have pens, if we need pens. Before you uh, write down all the things that I didn't cover on that training server, <laughs> survey, <laughs> is there anything I could cover real quick? Any questions? Do we feel OK? I assume we can upload like a PowerPoint. Yeah, and what I would do is uh, I would take that, that PowerPoint, export them all as pictures, which is an export in Power, uh, it's an option in PowerPoint. You just choose export pictures. It puts them all in a folder, and then you can just drag that whole folder into Wirecast. Okay. And it'll just put all those pictures in order. And you can adjust the, uh, if you're looking at Wirecast, you can adjust the preview size of, uh, of these if you kind of move your window up a little bit. Like, like click on the upper bar, yeah, and then just drag it up the other way. This guy right here, that little magnifying glass. So you can drag that that way, and it's going to make your previews larger so you can see what your slides are or make it smaller. How do you suggest monitoring it during the stream? It's a really good question. I suggest, if it's possible, monitor your stream on a separate internet connection uh, on a separate computer. Ideally, you have a laptop that's connected to a different network because as, as it takes bandwidth to upload, it takes bandwidth to download. And you don't you don't want to you want to do as as little as possible to weigh your bandwidth down. So if you're going to monitor your stream, which I recommend that you do, I recommend you do it on a separate computer on a separate network if that's possible. I know that's kind of asking a lot. Oftentimes, what I'll do is if I don't have that option, I'll uh, go ahead and, and have my uh, YouTube window open and I'll hit play and I'll watch it to make sure and then I'll pause it. And then, so that way it's not, it's not downloading it because it doesn't, it doesn't seem to buffer a live stream. So then you can hit play again and then go ahead and hit that little live button that'll, that'll show up and it'll take you back to the live so you can kind of preview and periodically check in on it. Um, but again, that's not ideal and ideally you are monitoring it separately constantly. Because again, there are so many variables. Um, you're broadcasting yourself and, and this has only been possible for like seven years or something. So. Uh, a little longer, whatever. So do a mock live stream with your team. Test, first. test, <laughs> test, absolutely. Before and then. Absolutely. I actually uh, have, we, we again, mentioning Colorado Trust, we do, year, uh, I don't know, every other month or so, something like that, we'll do a stream for them. And uh, we're, we're changing it up a little bit. We're going to do it at a different location. So I'm going to go on uh, Friday and bring my gear and test my gear there, uh, just to, and that's a week before the shoot, just to make sure that it all works in this different location. Um, and then even when we were at the same location, I would go the day before and check out everything, make sure that their internet connection was up to speed and that um, you know I wasn't going to run into any issues. So I do recommend. And then uh, you can save your show. So like we've created this, uh, all of these these shows. You can you can save that. So you can, you can create your show ahead of time with all your slides and all your cameras or whatever, and then you can save it, and then you can open it up again. Keep in mind that if you are adding different cameras to different ports on, uh, on a show that you've saved, it sometimes gets a little funky, and you have to mess with it. But um, again, you can set up must, much of it ahead of time. Should we delete anything on here, or is there something to do that? If you, if you, no, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll delete I'll do all that. Uh, as soon as I find that Thornton link and send it all to you guys. <laughs> sure, if you'd like to. If not, yeah. we can take care of that. Did everyone sign the signing sheet? Thank you, guys. I would encourage you, if you've not been here before and you're curious, to check out the tour that's happening in 10 minutes. Uh, it starts upstairs. Okay. What's the Berlin Secrets of the Universe? Secrets of the Universe, mostly. We, uh, kind of our mission uh, as, as OMF, the difference between OM, uh, Open Media Foundation and Denver Open Media, Media and uh, opportunities <coughs> to get involved. We talk to the web team, uh, kind of a tour of the studios, uh, and our educational offerings. I think that pretty much covers it.
skip that today, but I'll keep along with your website. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> no problem at all. Thank you no, for I coming. Am, I am intensely curious. It's just one of those things. Yeah, no, we have it twice a month, I think. Yeah. Okay, right. cool. Every Wednesday, so. Cool. Yeah, but I, I do encourage you to check out the website. It's a, it's a great organization right, with lots of resources for. Yeah, good for you, by the way. Thanks. Was don't it? Forget about our deep dive program, everybody. Um, free tech resources, basically, at your disposal. Um, so, Carcos find out more at our website. I put in. Yeah, you signed up for that. Yeah. Yes. Awesome. All good. Thanks, guys. Great Thank time. you. I don't see why not. Because we do. That's like the main goal. That's like the main goal. Well, we're bringing approval. Denver Urban Gardens, I'm sure you're very familiar with Yeah, uh, I actually I don't know why. I don't know. I don't think that would be a problem. Okay, cool. Well, I'll, I'll look into things.